All right, greetings, everyone. Welcome back to our Sunday school class on the Chronicles of Narnia. We're about halfway through the class, over halfway through now. And this morning, we're going to be exploring the topic of the moon, that is, Luna. Now, you may recall, last week, John Hodges led the discussion on the silver chair. So this week, um, I'm going to continue our discussion on the silver chair. But I want to begin, as usual, with some trivia questions for you. So here are your 10 trivia questions. Take a minute and see how well you do, and then we'll answer them together. All right, should we start answering these together? Let's go through them one by one. Number one, what is Jill's last name? Pole. P-O-L-E. Very good. Number two, what is the name of Jill and Eustace's school? Experiment House. Very good. Very good. It's a very progressive school. It's co-ed, which was cutting edge back then. And they didn't learn much Latin, and they had a problem with bullies. Yes, yes. There was all sorts of dysfunctions at that school. Uh, number three, how many signs does Aslan give to Jill? Four. four. Does anybody know what all four signs are? Yes. So Eustace will encounter an old friend who will help them on their quest. That's number one. Travel north to the ruined city of the giants. Yes. They have to go to the ruined city of the giants. And then number three is they have to um, follow the writing. They have to obey the writing that they find there. And then the last one is Aslan tells them that they'll meet somebody who commands them to do something in Aslan's name. So those are the four signs. All right, number four, who takes Jill and Eustace to the Parliament of Owls? Glimfeather. His name was Glimfeather. Yes, and he was an owl. And uh, let's see, number five, what river forms the border between Narnia and Ettensmore? Shribble, very good, very good. It's the River Shribble, which is not a very large river. I think it's more of a stream. I think it like gets Jill wet up to like her legs and that's about it. Knees, Knees. okay. <laughs> number six, who gets drunk at Harfang Castle? Puddle Glum. He's a respectable Marsh Wiggle, right? Uh, number seven, what sleeping giant do Jill and Eustace see underground? Father Time, very good, who also makes an appearance in The Last Battle, and that's a very significant part of the story that we'll talk about later. Number eight, whom do they capture and befriend as Underland collapses? He's a gnome. He's shorter, about three feet tall, kind of looks like a hippopotamus with pink eyes. His name, his name was Golg. G-O-L-G, Golg. And he comes from what land? Number nine, what is the land of the name of the realm deep below Underland? Bism. Very good, Bism, B-I-S-M. And tenth, finally, where does the headmistress of Jill and Eustace's school end up getting a job? In Parliament. That's the very last line of the, the story, I believe. Yeah, she ends up getting a job in Parliament because she was useless everywhere else. Yes. So, okay, there we have it. Those are our trivia questions. Now, today, we're going to be getting into Michael Ward's book and his chapter on the moon, or Luna, as it relates to the silver chair. Now, who could summarize for us, what was the thesis of Planet Narnia? What is Michael Ward's argument? Do you remember what he claimed about the Chronicles of Narnia, about the symbolism of the books? That's right. So he believed, uh, Ward argues that, that Lewis deliberately designed each book in the Chronicles of Narnia to reflect the symbolism of a corresponding planet within the medieval system. So, for example, the line of the witch in the wardrobe reflects Jupiter. Prince Caspian reflects Mars. The voyage of the dawn treader reflects Sol, the sun. And similarly, it's argued, the silver chair reflects the moon. And so I created a chart to help you see what all those connections are. So we've already covered the first three books. That brings us to the silver chair today. Ward's argument is, if you look at Lewis's writings and the medieval literature in general, there are certain themes that are always connected to the moon. The themes of wateriness or wetness, wandering, confusion, lunacy. That's how we get the word lunatic, from luna, the moon. Uh, and there's other symbols and themes as well, but those are the key ones. There's also a particular metal associated with each planet in the medieval system. And the metal of the moon is said to be silver. What's the title of the book today? Silver Chair. So there's a pretty obvious connection right there. Ward also makes the argument that there's something significant about the depiction of Aslan in each book of the Chronicles of Narnia. Ward argues that Lewis intentionally has As Aslan depict a different characteristic of Christ in each book within the Chronicles. 
So in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Aslan depicts Christ as king. In Prince Caspian, Aslan depicts Christ as commander. And in Voyage of the Dawn Treader, he depicts Christ as light. And as we'll see today, hopefully we'll have time for everything today, Aslan depicts Christ as the son, the submissive son. And so there are a lot of points that we're going to discuss today, so hopefully we can get through all of it. I want to give you some background in Lewis's other writings, just like I did with The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, so that you can see how Lewis himself understood the medieval symbolism associated with each planet. Michael Ward is not just making this up. He's actually an expert in C.S. Lewis, and um, we actually find these medieval themes all over C.S. Lewis's writings. But there are two writings of Lewis in particular that are especially helpful for the planet Narnia thesis. Lewis's final book, which was published after he died, was called The Discarded Image, which is an explanation of the medieval worldview. There's a whole chapter in there on the heavens, and he describes the symbolism of each planet in that chapter. It's very helpful in understanding the symbolism of the, the medieval planetary system. The other source that we'll look at is a poem that Lewis wrote earlier in his career called The Planets, where in poetic form he describes all the symbolism of each planet. But I'm going to begin with an excerpt from the discarded image where Lewis is describing the symbolism of the moon. This is actually the largest excerpt, um, the, the, the most material that Lewis has on any single planet. He writes about three times as much on the moon as he does for any of the other planets. Each other planet only gets like a paragraph or so. But um, he spends more time describing the symbolism of the moon because the moon is, in some respects, the most complicated uh, because it straddles the line between the heavens above and the earth below. And so the symbolism of the moon is somewhat mixed and confusing. So here's what Lewis says about the moon. At Luna, we cross the great frontier from ether to air. So in the medieval worldview, there was no such thing as empty space. It was believed that the heavens above were actually filled with an ether, which is a more refined air. Um, and so we move, as we descend um, from the heavens above to the heavens below, we cross from ether to air, from heaven to nature, from the realm of the gods or angels to that of demons, from the realm of necessity to that of contingence, from the incorruptible to the corruptible. So the moon represents this transition point between the, the pure, the clear, the fixed, the immutable heavens above and the shifting, confusing um, uh, land below, the earth below. And Lewis goes on to say, unless this great divide is firmly fixed in our mind, every passage, and, and he's going to cite some famous, famous English authors here, like John Donne or Michael Drayton, or whom you will, that mentions translunary or sublunary will lose its intended force. We shall take under the moon as a vague synonym like our under the sun for everywhere, when in reality it is used with precision. So when you see like English Renaissance authors use the expression under the moon, that has a very significant and specific meaning. It doesn't just mean like where we live or everywhere. It particularly refers to those qualities that distinguish the realm below the moon from that above the moon. So for example, when John Gower says, we that dwell under the moon stand in this world upon a weir, which is an old English word, he means exactly what he says. If we lived above the moon, we should not suffer weir, which means doubt or uncertainty. So those are concepts associated with the realm below the moon. And then Lewis goes on to say, her metal is silver, as we've already said. In men, she produces wandering, and this is key, in that, that in two senses. She may make them travelers, so wandering in a geographical sense, so that, as Gower says, the man born under Luna will seek many lands strange. But there's also another kind of wandering. She may also produce wandering of the wits, especially that periodical insanity which was first meant by the word lunacy. Where do we find that idea in the silver chair? Lunacy. Prince Rillian, right? When he's under the spell of the Lady of the Green Kirtle. Dante assigns the moon's sphere also to those who have entered the conventual life, that means like monks and nuns, and abandoned it for some good or pardonable reason. I'm going to come back to that notion um, in a little bit, so I'll, I'll discuss Dante later on in this class. So to sum that up, these are some of the themes that Lewis himself highlights and connects with the moon. 
The moon is uh, the boundary line between incorruptibility and corruptibility, between immutability and mutability, between insanity and sanity, between necessity and contingency. The moon's metal is silver. It produces wandering in two senses, both geographical and mental. And it's connected with doubt, or uh, as Gower called it, weir, the old English word. Those are all the themes, but there is one theme missing here that Lewis identifies in his earlier work, the poem that is called The Planets. Here's what Lewis has to say about Luna here in that poem. Lady Luna in light canoe by friths and shallows of fretted cloudland cruises monthly with chrism of dews and drench of dream, a drizzling glamour enchants us, the cheat changing sometime, a mind to madness, melancholy pale, bleached with gazing on her blank countenance, orbed and ageless. In earth's bosom, the shower of her rays, sharp feathered light reaching downward, ripens silver, forming and fashioning female brightness, metal maiden-like. Her moist circle is nearest earth. So the sun was associated with maleness and produced gold, but the moon is associated with femininity and produces silver. But there are certain words that Lewis is using here that call to mind a certain idea. Look at all those underlined words there. What do they all have in common? Water. The moon was associated with water for a couple of reasons, I think, because, you know, at nighttime, things were drenched in dew, and that's when the moon came out. But also, the moon is responsible for the tides, so the rising tides could make things wet. So I think for those reasons, the moon was associated with wetness. And so that's a theme that, that we see um, in Lewis's writing associated with the moon as well. So these are the themes that we will be exploring together. And we're going to see how do these themes connect to the silver chair? How did they influence the writing of this particular novel in the Chronicles of Narnia? So I'm going to highlight five themes, four of which come from Ward himself. And one was my own observation, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So the first theme we'll look at is wetness, then we'll look at wandering, and then paleness, then silver, and then fifth, we'll look at the theme of inconstancy, which is my own observation. But beginning with wetness, it is without a doubt, the silver chair is the wettest of all the books in the Chronicles of Narnia. You read this book and you feel like you're getting wet yourself. It's just, it's cold, it's damp, it's just drenched in the atmosphere of the book itself. And we see it repeatedly throughout the book. The first couple chapters, just notice the references to wetness or wateriness. Now, I do want to highlight something. Ward himself used the word wateriness to describe this theme. I think wetness is a better word to use, and here's why. For those of you who have kids or grandkids, you might have, be familiar with this ongoing debate over whether or not water is wet. Have you guys heard about this debate? The argument being, water itself is not wet, it makes things wet. Well, I think that actually means that wetness is the better word to describe the silver chair, because the silver chair is not the book with the most water. That claim goes to the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is a sea voyage, right? They're in the ocean. But things get wet more often in the silver chair. And so um, we see this from the first chapter. Look at you know, how Jill Pole was crying on the damp little path. So it's during autumn. It's a wet autumn in England. Um, Eustace then sits down on the grass that was soaking wet. There are drops that dripped off the laurel trees and then drops of water on the grass. So already we have this imagery of wetness. Chapter 2, when they travel to Aslan's Mountain, we see more. There's, of course, the stream of Aslan at Aslan's Mountain. And then they're blown by Aslan's breath. And, and when that happens, Jill can move as freely as, if, as you can in water if you've learned to float really well. And then as she passes down into Narnia below, she's blown into the wet fogginess of a cloud that makes her clothes wet. And then she's splashed by the wave of a sea, drenching her nearly to the waist. The final words of chapter 2 are Jill's words, how wet I am. And it just continues throughout the book. Rain is mentioned frequently. It rains, it, it, rain is mentioned at least six times in the book. And we have repeated references to marshes and muddy water. There are countless channels of water. Of course, the character Puddle Glum himself. Think about his name, Puddle Glum. And he's a marsh wiggle. So he's also described as a wet blanket. So that watery imagery is just recurring over and over. The river shrivel, as we mentioned previously, makes Jill wet to the knees. You were right about the knees. On the way to Harfang, they get too wet by now to bother about being a bit wetter. 
And then, of course, at the end, you know, um, when they're at, in Underland, there's the underground sea, and then everything collapses in a flood. So everything just gets soaking wet throughout this book. Um, so there's really no denying wetness is an important theme in this book. Now, as we've mentioned before, not every scholar is on board with Michael Ward's Planet Narnia thesis. Not everyone is convinced that each book is intended to depict one of the medieval planets. But if that's the case, you have to ask, why is wetness such an important theme in this book? If it's connected with Luna, as Ward argues, it would make sense. So it does have some explanatory power there. Same with the next theme of wandering. And remember, according to Lewis, um, there's two types of wandering produced by the moon. There's geographical wandering and there's mental wandering. And we see both types of wandering in the silver chair. Here's what Ward says. From the instability of water, we move to the spatial and mental instability that derive from lunar influence. The three adventurers search for Prince Rillian, a search that is fitful and hapless, uh, suggests both kinds of water, wandering. Um, and so we can look at the character Rillian himself, who embodies wandering in both senses. So we, we learn that he went on a quest to find his mother, and that quest is described as um, wanderings. Or not to find his mother, but his mother's murderer. Remember, she was killed by the serpent at the beginning of the story. Um, and then he disappears, and he's missing for like 10 years. And then when they finally encounter Rillian in Underland, he talks about his nightly lunacy, when my mind is most horribly changed by a fury or a frenzy or ravings, and he's described as a lunatic. And then after he um, is disenchanted and the spell is broken, he describes himself and his rescuers as we four wanderers. So this is a recurring theme within um, uh, the silver chair. But not only that, but look at how the structure of Narnia itself, the geography itself is depicted. Now, John had made the point last week how there's sort of a resurrection theme within the silver chair. There's a descent followed by an ascent. But that also points to wandering, according to Michael Ward. We see in the world of Narnia, there is a layered system where you have, they, they start out in England, and they travel to Aslan's country, and then they descend into Narnia, and then they descend deeper into Underland, and we get a glimpse of an even deeper realm called Bism, which is where the gnomes come from. And then they make their way up. And so the, the, the plot follows this U-shaped trajectory of descent and ascent, which corresponds to the wandering of the adventurers. But this is where lunar symbolism is so significant in that descent and ascent. Because as Lewis had described in the, um, in the discarded image, the, the moon represents the boundary between ether and air. And so as you move from the heavens above to the earth below, you pass from a realm of ether to a, a realm of air. And look at how Aslan describes the descent from his mountain down to Narnia when he's speaking to Jill. He says this to her, Here on the mountain the air is clear and your mind is clear. You're saying you're in full possession of your wits when you're on Aslan's mountain. But as you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind. And the signs which you have learned here will not look at all as you expect them to look when you meet them there. That's very lunar imagery. This descent from ether to air, from certainty to confusion, that's very much connected to the medieval understanding of the moon. Um, because think about how the moon appears in the night sky. It's waxing and it's waning. It's constantly changing its appearance, which causes confusion. That's why it was associated with lunacy, instability. And we see that as the heroes descend from Aslan's mountain to Narnia, where the air thickens. And so I think Ward is on pretty solid footing here in connecting this to um, uh, the moon. And the third category is also very, very explicit in the silver chair. Next time you read the silver chair, just pay attention to how many times does Lewis use the word pale. It, is a, it occurs over and over and over again. And this is unique to this book. The word does not occur with nearly such frequency in the other books in the Chronicles of Narnia. So here's how Ward puts it. Before the heroes enter Underland, we've already read of pale hills, pale sunlight, and of Puddleglum's face, so pale that you could see the paleness under the natural muddiness of his complexion. Now, uh, in Underland, almost everything becomes melancholy pale. 
and the adjective pale is found attached to almost every available noun. Pale earthmen, pale sand, pale lanterns, pale beaches, pale lamps, pale light. Eustace's face is pale and dirty. Rillian's face is as pale as putty. A lord with a pale face welcomes Caspian home, who is himself very pale. Aslan touches the pale faces of Jill and Eustace. That's a lot of pales, isn't it? Lewis was of the view that the re recurrence of a single word can be an undoubtedly necessary element in establishing the tone of a passage. This is an example of an occasion where he overdoes it. And you got to ask yourself, if the planet Narnia thesis was not true, why is Lewis emphasizing paleness so much in the silver chair? A theme that is so clearly connected to the moon. And so I think there is a pretty strong explanatory power in this theory. What Lewis is trying to do, if, if Ward is correct, is he's trying to paint a particular atmosphere with each book within the Chronicles of Narnia. Remember our term Donegality? So there's a particular flavor associated with uh, each book. And so the flavor of the silver chair, the donegality of the silver chair is connected to paleness and wandering and wateriness. And of course, there's the metal of the moon, which is silver, which occurs a lot, not only in the title of the book, but here's what Ward says. Lewis's use of silver is more evenly spaced throughout the book. It appears first in the title. Once past the cover, we find a row of shields bright as silver at Ker Paravel, a silver mail shirt for Caspian, a silver ear trumpet for Trumpkin, a lamp in Jill's castle room that hangs by a silver chain. During her nighttime flight on Glimfeather, Jill sees a patch of watery silver. Watery and silver, two lunar elements right there. The porter at the giant's castle complains that the silver, that is cutlery, salt cellars, etc., will keep on getting over here. In the underworld, they see a pure silver light. The witch has soft silver laughs. Bism has real silver, different from the dead silver of the superficial mines. Rillian's black shield turns bright as silver upon his disenchantment, and he reclothes himself in silver mail. The dying Caspian is welcomed home by a flourish of silver trumpets. Chief of all the silvers, of course, is the eponymous silver chair, that vile engine of sorcery. So if you remember from the story, it's the silver chair that, that keeps Rillian under the spell. Um, he thinks that um, uh, each night he, he experiences these, these episodes of lunacy, and he needs to be strapped down to the silver chair in order to maintain his uh, sanity. But it's really the chair that's keeping him insane and, and causing him to forget who he really is, the Prince Rillian. So silver's all over the place as well. Here's the theme that I observed, and I want to hear y'all's thoughts on this. Because uh, as some of you know, I mentioned this last time, I think, I've been reading through the Divine Comedy by Dante. So just this past week, I finished reading Inferno. Um, and I'm, I've been reading uh, bits and pieces of Paradiso as well. Dante's Paradiso describes Dante's ascent up through the spheres of the heavens to the highest heaven where God himself is. So um, he first goes through hell, then through purgatory, and then ascends up through the spheres of heaven. And each sphere of heaven has its own associated planet. So he has to go through the heaven of each planet. And each sphere is said to be associated with a different type of saint. And so last time when we looked at um, the sphere of the sun connected with the voyage of the dawn treader, that was said to be the sphere of philosophers and theologians. So who goes to the sphere of the moon? This is actually the first of the heavenly spheres, and here's how Dante describes it. So who is Dante's traveling companion in heaven? Does anyone know? Beatrice. Her name is Beatrice, and she is the most beautiful woman that Dante had ever known during his earthly life. She had died at a young age, but he... Uh, he makes her the heroine of his story, um, his companion during their ascent through the heavens of paradise. And so she is uh, his guide explaining each sphere of the heavens. And she says to Dante, when they encounter these um, souls, now at first Dante, when he looks at these souls in the sphere of the moon, he's confused by them because they look like reflections in a pool. They don't look like they're actual people. So he looks behind him to see, like, are they reflecting somebody who's standing behind him? But there's nobody there. And Beatrice thinks this is somewhat humorous because, no, what he sees, that really is how they look in this sphere of heaven. They look like reflections in a pool, but that is their true substance. And here's how Beatrice describes them. These are true substances you see before you. They are assigned here for inconstancy to holy vows. Greet them. 
Heed what they say and so believe, for the true light that fills them permits no soul to wander from its ray. As Beatrice is describing here, the sphere of the moon is the heaven for those who took monastic vows, whether they were monks or nuns. But, and then Lewis describes this in the discarded image, as we had previously read. They broke their vows. For some reason that was understandable. It wasn't out of disobedience or defiance. It was for some understandable or pardonable reason. And so one of the souls that they encounter here among the inconstant is a woman named Picarda, who was formerly a nun. And here's what she says to Dante and Beatrice. I am Picarda. And I am placed here among these other souls of blessedness to find my blessedness in the slowest sphere. So even though these souls are in the lowest sphere of heaven, they are perfectly content where they are. Um, as, as Picarda um, goes on to say, um, in, in God's will, we find our peace. And so they're, they're fully satisfied even with the lowest rank in heaven. And so here's what she says. Our wishes, which can have no wish to be but in the pleasure of the Holy Ghost, rejoice in being formed to his decree. And this low-seeming post which we are given is ours because we broke, or in some part slighted, the vows which we offered up to heaven. So these souls are still in heaven. They are blessed saints, but they're of the lowest rank because they broke heavenly vows. Does that sound familiar to you from the silver chair? Is there any idea like that that comes close? Let me suggest that the theme of inconstancy can be expressed through the heroes when they muff the signs of Aslan. Okay? Remember, Aslan has given Jill four signs. And then as they go on their adventure, they mess up the first three. And by the time they get to Harfang Castle, they finally realized. Now, it's not that they were willfully defiant or disobedient. They were just tired. They were confused. They weren't paying attention like they should have been. And so, understandable reasons, but they they missed the signs. And here's how they discuss it. It's my fault, Jill said in despairing tones. I'd given up repeating the signs every night. If I'd been thinking about them, I could have seen it was the city even in all that snow. So they had passed right through the ruined city, which was supposed to be the third sign. I'm worse, said Puddle Glum. Or was it? No, that was the second sign, sorry. Uh, I'm worse, said Puddle Glum. I did see, or nearly. I thought it looked uncommonly like a ruined city. You're the only one who isn't to blame, said Scrub. You did try to make us stop. And then Eustace went on. So it's no good, Pole. I know what you were thinking because I was thinking the same thing. You were thinking how nice it would have been if Aslan hadn't put the instructions on the stone of the ruined city till after we'd passed it. He's talking about the third sign there. And then it would have been his fault, not ours. So likely, isn't it? No, we must just own up. We've only four signs to go by, and we've muffed the first three. Does that sound like inconstancy to you? They, they, their quest was based on obeying these signs from Aslan. That's what they had committed themselves to. But they messed it up. They missed the signs. They muffed the signs. And so I think this is another way that we see the symbolism of the moon woven into the plot of the silver chair. So what do you guys think? You think I'm right about this inconstancy theme? Last week, I actually contacted Michael Ward himself. And I asked him what he thought about this observation. And he actually just responded to me back on, on Friday and said, yeah, Kyle, I think you're right. I think that the inconstancy of our adventurers in the silver chair in muffing the signs is a, is a, is a reflection of the inconstancy of the moon. So I have it on good authority. This, this is a pretty valid inference. So um, there you have it. These are some of the lunar themes that we find in the silver chair. But it's not just about the way the story is written. It's not just about creating an atmosphere. I'm going to introduce two new terms for you. And these terms are, um, Ward describes these in each of his chapters on the planets. We haven't yet mentioned them because I don't want to overwhelm you with too much new vocabulary. But I've been talking about Donegality, about the particular atmosphere, the flavor of each book. Well, that corresponds to the, our, our enjoyment of the stories, right? So what's the point in Lewis depicting paleness or silver or wateriness or wandering or inconstancy? Well, it's not necessarily that there's a message to be inferred from that, and yet there is a message in the silver chair associated with the moon. 
You may recall from the chart that I showed previously that in each of the books in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan in particular is, dis- is depicting some characteristic of Christ. So in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he's depicting Christ as king. In Prince Caspian, he's depicting Christ as commander. In The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, he's depicting Christ as light. How does Aslan depict Christ in the silver chair? This one is probably the trickiest of all the books, which Ward himself admits. Because Aslan doesn't actually appear in Narnia in this book. He's only in the the mountain of Aslan, right? So when they descend into Narnia, they themselves, the heroes, are the representatives of Aslan, but Aslan himself doesn't make an appearance in Narnia in this book. So that makes it difficult to identify which qualities of Christ are being portrayed by Aslan in this story. But Ward argues, perhaps the the Christ-like quality is being displayed by the heroes themselves in this story because of the particular Christ-like quality of the moon itself. Notice how the moon stands in the lights of the heavens, right? It's the secondary light. Or as it's described in Genesis, it's the lesser light, right? There's the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. So the moon is, in a sense, secondary to the sun. Ward makes the point that that is somewhat similar to the relationship of the father to the son. Now, we got to be careful here because Ward doesn't comment on this, but he's actually stepping on a theological landmine here, which has been like a very controversial subject over the past 10 or so years. There's been an ongoing debate among evangelical theologians over the so-called eternal submission of the Son. Is it proper to describe the Son's eternal relationship within the Trinity as one of authority and submission in his relationship to the Father? Um, And there's a lot of debates over that, and there's a lot of um, nuances to the whole discussion, and I don't want to get bogged down on those things. But I think there is an idea here that Ward is correctly identifying from a theological standpoint. And he's on good ground, historically speaking, as we understand the doctrine of the Trinity. If we are to describe the Father and the Son in these terms, like solar and lunar, we got to be careful to avoid the heresy of Arianism, right? We are not saying that Jesus is a lesser God, that he's a created being. He is of one substance with the Father, as the Nicene Creed says. But there is also a sense in which the Son receives his divinity from the Father. He reflects the Father's glory. That is very biblical, and it's historically orthodox as well. And look at how Aslan is described um, in the silver chair in particular, because Aslan is never said to be silver in the silver chair, which you might expect... If, if Lewis is intending to be consistent with this lunar theme. But there's a reason why Aslan is instead depicted as golden. Aslan's image on the flag at Ker Paravel is golden. And Aslan himself is three times described as golden. He has a golden voice, a golden back, and looks to Jill at one point like a speck of bright gold. Lewis has not forgotten the donegality of the book and suddenly decided to depict him under the rubric of soul. Rather, under the rubric of Luna, he's saying something important about Christ's submission to the Father, which was one of his favorite Christological themes. Now, Lewis accepted the Nicene and Athanasian creeds with their insistence on the co-eternity of the Son with the Father, but believed that the essential equality of divine being among the persons of the Trinity was not incompatible with an ordering, even a kind of hierarchy therein. Let me comment on that very briefly. When the, tr- the persons of the Trinity decided from all eternity to enact the plan of redemption, to atone for the sins of God's people, it wasn't just based on a flip of a coin that the Son was sent rather than the Father or the Holy Spirit to die for our sins. It was fitting that it was the Son who was sent to die for our sins, to become incarnate. It would not have been fitting for the Father to be sent because the Father is the sender, not the sendee. As the way theologians put it, the missions of the Trinity reflect the processions of the Trinity. As they are towards us is a reflection of how they are towards themselves. And so that is why it is the Son who submits to the Father in becoming man, in submitting to the law, in dying on the cross, in being resurrected, in being our mediator, in atoning for our sins. It was fitting that the Son should do that. Because just as the Son proceeds from the Father, he's begotten of the Father So he's sent by the Father for our redemption. 
And in the same way, both the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit to us to indwell us. Lewis continues, Nevertheless, because the Son is perfectly silver, he's also, within the mystery of the Trinity, perfectly golden, because he's utterly receptive to that higher but no more divine light coming forth from the first person. And if you read like the historic Trinitarian theologians like Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and so forth, this idea is all over the place. The idea of uh, the Father perfectly and completely communicating the divine essence to the Son, the Son perfectly receiving the, the essence from the Father such that they perfectly share one single divine essence, but one gives it and the other receives it. So this is very biblical. What Lewis is saying here is well within the, the, the framework of Christian orthodoxy. And here's how uh, Ward concludes this part. Aslan's goldenness in this book is a different kind of goldenness from the one we find in the voyage of the Don Treader. There it was solar. Here it is paradoxically lunar, the good upper half of the lunar nature. So you may recall the moon stands at the boundary between the immutable, the constant, the fixed heavens above and the changing, confusing, unstable earth below. If the scriptural justification for the Don Treader was, I am the light of the world, the scriptural justification for the silver chair is, the Father is greater than I, and yet he who has seen me has seen the Father. The task for the heroes is to demonstrate that kind of sun-like humility and to beat down the temptation to believe that there is nothing higher than themselves. In other words, the heroes are meant to stand in contrast to the villain, the Lady of the Green Kirtle. You may remember the spell that she tries to put them under, trying to convince them that there is no sun. All there is is this moon below, right? So she sort of symbolizes the negative aspect of the moon, the envy of the moon. So envy is another theme associated with the moon within the medieval worldview, in the same sense that perhaps could the moon be envious of the sun. Well, in the the Lady of the Green Kirtle's denial of the sun, that's what we see happen in a negative sense. But the heroes instead resist that pull. They resist that temptation. And they recognize proper submission. And so in that sense, they are um, embodying the positive lunar quality of submission. And so that's the point that Ward concludes in that chapter. And I want to conclude with, I think, a very relevant biblical passage that supports that final um, Christological theme in the silver chair. This comes from John chapter 5, which is, I think one of the clearest biblical depictions of this idea of the son's eternal generation from the father, that he receives from the father all that he is, all that he has, but in such a way that he perfectly reflects his father, such that they share one divine nature, one divine essence. Here's what Jesus himself says. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. All right. Well, next week, we're moving into the horse and his boy. And I'm up again. So I think I'm teaching all the rest of the lessons for the month of March. So I'm looking forward to this one. This one is connected to Mercury, as I recall. So we're going to explore some of those mercurial themes over the next couple of weeks. All right. Are there any final questions or comments? So the question was, do I recommend an audiobook to follow along? Yes, I actually found something for free on Apple Podcast. There is um, an audiobook channel called Heisenbook. So you know like Heisenberg? Um, like with the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, or if you know the show Breaking Bad, um, it's called Heisenbook. Heisenbook. They actually have the audiobooks of all the Chronicles of Narnia for free. And get this, I just finished listening to The Last Battle. You want to know who the narrator is? Patrick. Patrick Stewart. You can't beat that, can you? So yes, check out Heisenbook on Apple Podcast. You'll find all the Chronicles of Narnia on audiobook for free. So they are available on Spotify Premium, but they're, they're arranged in chronological order. So if you want to follow our publication order, you have to find the right book in the sequence. Yes. Honestly, I thought that this one was a little bit of a stretch. I'm not sure if Lewis 
consciously intended to depict this aspect of Christ in the silver chair. If it had been the case, I would have expected some reference to the emperor beyond the sea, right? Or Aslan submitting to him. Um, however, I, I still think it's a valid application, and I'm sure Lewis would approve of it. I'm just not so, so sure Lewis had that in mind as he was writing this book. Now, the Donegality, you know, paleness and silver, I, I'm pretty convinced of that. But yeah, the, 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 the Christ application at the end that, that Ward talks about, it's, it's a good application. I'm not so sure Lewis actually had it in mind, though. Yes, and so and this gets into the whole Trinitarian debates over the eternal subordination of the Son. Um, there are some well-respected theologians who do hold to that view. And one of their reasons for affirming that view, um, let me just repeat it for the recording. So you were talking about how some people have the mistaken uh, understanding that um, submission implies inferiority. And that is not the case necessarily, right? We see, like, um, within Scripture, um, citizens are subject to their rulers, but that doesn't make the rulers better than them. Wives are, are called to submit to their husbands, but that does not make them inferior. Could we say something like the relationship of the son towards the father similarly? Well, yes, we can. In fact, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the, the, the opening verses says that, that just as the head of the woman is her husband, so the head of Christ is God. Um, there's debates over, is that referring to Christ in the incarnation, or is that referring to the eternal triune relations? And that's where we get into some muddy waters there. And you got to be very careful and very precise with your words, because otherwise, like, those who have PhDs in theology will be infuriated. I, I would just say, um, there are some things that we should avoid when we talk about the relation of the Father and Son. We don't want to say that they have two separate wills. They share one divine will. Within the classical theistic tradition, that has been unanimously affirmed. So there's a modern movement called social trinitarianism, which kind of divides their wills. That, the problem with that is that kind of gets us into polytheism, right? If we believe in one God, they have to share one divine will. But within that, is there a way of talking about authority and submission? There are some classical sources, um, like I just read uh, the, um, a medieval theologian named Bonaventure who does use that language. So I think there is an appropriate place for it. We just have to be careful about how we use our terminology there. Any other final thoughts or comments? All right, well, I will close this in prayer, and then we can get ready for corporate worship. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for his submission that he uh, assumed flesh and became one of us and represented us and redeemed us through his atoning work, through his perfect life and sacrificial death. We pray, Lord, that in our own lives, we could reflect that filial submission, that we would show proper obedience and submission, chiefly to you. And we do pray, Lord, that um, you would give us a spirit of humility and understanding. Help us to, to walk with confidence and clarity and not in confusion. We do thank you, Lord, for uh, this class, and we, we pray for your continued blessing upon it as we move forward. In Christ's name, amen.